Hey Tom, set the stage for me here. You spent four years at Syracuse, you come into the NBA as a rookie, and Michael Jordan's on your team. What were your first interactions with MJ, and how was that relationship over those two seasons? Oh, it was crazy. You know, it was like, and I tell people, it was like traveling with Michael Jackson. You know what I mean? Or like the Beatles or something like that. Right? And, and it's, we would go to a town and literally there would be thousands of people, you know, waiting for us. And I saw people like look at him and like start crying. Like, you know, like Michael Jackson, <laughs> I was like, they would just start crying or they would touch him and like faint. And we were, like, we were just looking like, wow, this, because after a while, you know, we got used to him. We see him every single day. We're practicing with him. We're doing film sessions. We're playing, you know, every single day. So we got used to him. But then when we left and we traveled, that's when we really was like, okay, yeah, now this is different. Like he couldn't go to regular places. I remember one time we were going to Cleveland and they had to shut down the whole mall because he wanted to go and, you know, he wanted to go out to eat. So literally they shut down the whole mall and we went through the back and there were still people all around trying to, you know, get a glimpse of him and stuff like that. It's just, it was just a really different type of living. You know, it was, it was a lot. I, I don't know if I would have wanted all of that because he couldn't do anything regular. He couldn't go to like the grocery store or like, you know, and get some gas or, you know, go through the drive through or Chick-fil-A. He couldn't do none of that. Exactly. I mean, if you look at those mega stars like a Michael Jackson, they couldn't go anywhere. They used to have to shut down groceries so we could go grocery shopping if we really right. wanted to. You know, it's like, that's the price of fame. But, but how did MJ handle all that stuff? MJ was cool. Like, now, this is the thing, though. If you ask 10 people, you'll probably get 10 different descriptions. And my description with MJ, my interaction with him was always really positive. I mean, I was kind of quiet, you know, my, my, my rookie year. I'm there and I see, you know, it's, it's Popeye Jones and Oakley and all those guys my first two years. So I was really just quiet, just watching. So, you know, my interactions with him was really more one-on-one. -on -one. You know, we would talk kind of, you know, we one-on-one -on -one in the training room or something like that. But, um, yeah, all positive. I, I don't have a negative thing to say about him for my interaction. But like I said, you ask somebody else, they'll say something different. <laughs> it, it all depends on who you're going to come across and, you know, maybe who got punched in the face in practice, you know? <laughs> And Eton, this is a fan question from, you know, NBA Buzz Facebook. I, I kind of laid out some questions to, to have you. Um, you saw the 38 to 40 year old MJ in practice every day. Was he still training as hard as he was in his prime? And did he still have that cutthroat, you know, mentality in practice? Definitely did. But his body was different. He had a 40 year old body. So sometimes I remember one time and we was in the training room and you know, his knee would swell up after games sometimes, and he would have to get him drained. <clears throat> and to that point, that was the nastiest thing I'd ever seen. So I'm sitting there with, an, you know, in the training room, just getting some ice or stem or something like that. And, you know, they, they, they come in and his knee is swollen, looks like, like the elephant man or something like that. So they come out with this big needle and they drain it and like this black tar goo looking stuff came out. And I'm sitting there looking at him. This is the second year. Um, and I'm sitting there looking at him, and I'm, I asked him, I was like, why are you doing this? Like, honestly, you don't have to play. You're MJ. Like, why are you even doing this? And, his, and he looked at me, and he just kind of shook his head like he didn't have an answer. And then he went back to looking at his knee. You know, but he, so his body was just different. But he, as far as the drive, the push, everything like that, he had all that. I mean, he was so competitive, you know, every day of practice. If we're doing a scrimmage, like just a little scrimmage to, you know, to five, to something like that. He wanted to win. Like uh, it was, yeah, it, but it was, it was just older. So Etan, you know, we saw the 40 year old MJ score 50 points in the somewhat modern NBA. It was changing around that time a little bit. Um, what would a prime MJ average today? People don't think he could hang in this era. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, he would dominate in this era. I mean, because the defense is different. So people have to, like, I was watching with my son, Malcolm. I've been watching old old games and stuff like that with my son says because there's nothing on. So we're watching um, when he was going against the Pistons and they had the MJ rules. And every time he went into the lane, it was like, pow! Like, you know what I mean? Like a hard foul. Not like a little touch foul. Like a hard foul. All fouls that all would have been flagrants in this day and age. And he had to figure it out. So in this day and age where you can't even touch someone, <laughs> I mean, he would, how would you guard him? Like he would be impossible to guard. So he would just come in and like, you think Giannis is a problem? MJ right now, I mean, it would be amazing. So that, 
I can't even imagine MJ right now in this where people can't guard him. You can't you can't check him. You can't hard foul him. You can't do anything. Yeah, I can't even imagine that. Along with that, what I tell people, you know, I'm a huge MJ fan. I tell people he would he has a mentality that he would develop an insane three pointer because that's just the way of the game. So add a three pointer in there. You can't touch him. I see I see forty points per game from MJ in today's era. Oh no question. I say fifty. <laughs> I would say fifty points a game. And the year after MJ retired, you had a career best season, averaging 8.9 points per game, 6.7 rebounds per game, and 1.6 blocks per game. What exactly clicked that year? Um, Doug Collins got fired. <laughs> that was really basically it. <laughs> Doug Collins got fired. They started all over. You know, they went younger guys. Um, you know, Eddie Jordan came in and he said, the best guys are going to play. You have a clean slate. And you show me, and he made that announcement at the beginning, so I just played my way into the lineup, and it just kind of took off from there. Uh, I think before with MJ, uh, he was more comfortable with veteran guys. So that's where we got, you know, Popeye Jones and um, Charles Oakley and Leitner and, you know, Zach. I, they, that's who he was more comfortable with, which I understand it because it was really like, a, you know, the, the age different, the age gap. It was amazing because you had young cats, and he just had older cats. I won't call them old, but older cats, you know? So the person who I really felt bad for was Kwame. Um, because Kwame, when he came into the league, he was the best person in the draft, hands down. It wasn't close. I saw it with my own two eyes. They brought in all the top big men, right? This is right at the Verizon Center. They brought them all in. He went against Tyson Chandler. He went against Eddie Curry, you know, and he destroyed all of them. Like, it wasn't even close. Like, it wasn't even close. And, you know, coming there and having the pressure of, of playing next to MJ and really Doug Collins. Like, you know, I mean, Kwame won't say it now, but I can say it because I was there. Doug Collins, you know, it was almost like he had a personal vendetta against Kwame. You know, like I would text him after sometimes. I'd be like, are you all right, man? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know why he's going at you so hard. Like, he wanted to almost take his confidence. But it was really if things didn't go right, he wanted to blame somebody and not blame MJ. That's what I think. So Kwame got all the blame, you know, and it was just, it was messed up. But, you know, and, but playing with MJ, Kwame would, would watch MJ and watch his habits, watch the things that he's doing and stuff like that. But with Doug Collins in that situation, I really felt bad for him. That's interesting. And I've really never heard anybody say that. Maybe they don't have, you know, the, the balls, for lack of better terms, to say that about Collins in that situation. And also a lot of people don't know because they weren't there. You know what I mean? A lot of people just look at it and say, well, you know, Kwame was the number one pick and, you know, he didn't pan out the way you think a number one pick would pan out. And I was like, well, there's a whole lot more involved in it than that. You know, if he, if he was the number two pick and was in a different situation, we just saw a completely different Kwame. You know, when, when Tyson Shelley went to the Bulls, and of course he's a fantastic player still playing now, but he didn't have any pressure. He didn't have MJ next to him. He didn't have Doug Collins looking to blame him for everything. He could just relax and play. And if Kwame had that kind of a situation, you would have seen a completely different Kwame. Crazy to think about. And, and what, was, what was MJ and Kwame's relationship like? I'm sorry to keep asking you all these questions about MJ, but very, very interesting, you know, stuff here. Oh, well, I mean, from what I saw, it was um, MJ just wanted to win. He just had a competitor. So that's all he was focused on. Um, and you know, his relationship with Kwame looked all right to me, you know, it looked like he, you know, pushed him just as much as he pushes everybody else. So I, I don't think that MJ was the problem with that. I think it was more Doug Collins, but I think Doug Collins also, you know, he wanted to protect MJ and protect it. it There's just so much more going on. So Kwame had to take the blame for everything. And it was just, it was a messed up situation for an 18 year old kid to come into, you know, it really was. It, but, and it know, probably, it probably scarred him for the rest of his career. Oh, I, I, how could it not? I mean, because you don't see, they, I, and I wonder if they're going to show this in the documentary, but really the way that, you know, I mean, it was just, I, I don't even know how to explain it the, some of the times where things wouldn't even be Kwame's fault, but it would just be all on him. And it, it was just like, that's why I said sometimes I would text him, me and Kwame, we're like the closest on the team. Like, that was my guy. And a lot of it was sometimes I would see it. I was like, man, that's not fair. This is not fair. Why are y'all doing him? You know what I mean? But I think that one of the things that you learn from MJ, and there's so much we learn because we talk about it. You know, because I was there with Tyrone Lou, Tyrone Nesby, you know, uh, Courtney Alexander, Richard Hamilton, and we talked about it. We saw how MJ 
had that drive and how people changed on him when he didn't have a good game. So I remember one time in particular, um, you know, he played, he didn't play well. We lost. It was really bad. Um, you know, the headlines was like, is MJ too old or should he tarnish his image and things like that. And that very next game was when he had the amazing, you know, breaking the record for the oldest person game, uh, like the very next one. And he was sitting there like, I don't even know if he slept that night because I believe it was a back to back. If my memory serves me correctly, I don't even think he slept like he stayed in the gym and was just working out. And there was like um, a few moves that he missed and he, he must have done the moves at least a hundred times, you know what I mean, with no defense. Like, just did it over and over again. Like, he was ready for that next game. So, and I don't even remember who we played the next game. Was it, ah, I don't remember. I had to look, go back, and one of the things that we were surprised on, and we was all talking, was like, wow, just a day ago, they were all trashing him, saying that he was terrible, he was old, he should never came back, all this. And in 24 hours, <laughs> now he's back to being MJ the God. You know what I mean? And it's like, so then we started looking at the media. We had a whole conversation amongst ourselves, like, wow, the media will tear you down in a minute if they'll tear down MJ. But we really gained a level of respect for him because, like I said, he didn't have to do none of that. Like, his, his legacy was set. He didn't have to play anymore. And he was playing through so many injuries that people didn't know about. You know, I saw firsthand with the knee draining thing. And it, like I said, he had to do that a lot and keep trying to play. So... I gained a lot of respect for him. But needless to say, I'm very interested in seeing this documentary someday. Were you at that game where MJ and Kobe went head-to-head where they each put up like 30 to 40 points against each other? You know, they hugged each other on the sideline when they bumped into each other. Can you tell me about that experience if you remember it? Kobe had, like, that was like a, you know, I'm going to show everybody type of a game for Kobe. Like, he was, like, he must have told all his teammates, look, Y'all not getting the ball, so don't even expect it. And they literally didn't look like they expected to get the ball, <laughs> like, honestly. And that was like a statement game for Kobe. But then it was like all love and respect. You know what I mean? So it was like both at the same time. And it was funny because I remember hearing uh, Magic talk about MJ having that moment with the Dream Team. And it was like a statement game for him where Magic had to be like, all right, the, the torch is passed. But it was still a respect thing. So it was interesting seeing that same thing happen with Kobe. There was one time where he, you know, he, he fell over him and he was standing there for a minute, you know, and T. Lou came over like, what you doing? You know, but it was all love and he, they came, came up and they embraced and all that. So it was all a respect thing, but it was, that, that was really amazing to see, you know, I had a good seat on the bench. <laughs> it was amazing to see, you know, front row that happened. That was like, like historical. And Ethan, I was reading on your website last night about Michael Jordan's unknown activism that you experienced. You know, it had to do with MJ at a golf course and that Jordan wouldn't play there unless they lifted a rule against African-Americans. I'm, you know, I, I know it's along those lines. Can you give me that, that exact story? I mean, that's basically what happened. You know, we were sitting there in the, um, in the locker room and, you know, he was telling his story and the, some of the guys around him, you know, was, one was his bodyguard, one was his trainer and, you know, a couple of guys were all around him and they were telling the story. And I was looking and I was like, oh, wow, that's great. I was like, well, why don't you tell people this? You know, because honestly, you know, whenever I'm at a, you know, athlete and activism forum or a panel or something like that, MJ is always casted as like the antithesis of the activist athlete because of the statement of Republicans buy shoes to and that, you know, that's just something he's never going to be able to let down. I, I wish that he would have shown a lot of the things that he does. And I saw firsthand. And I would always say, I was like, yeah, y'all don't know MJ like you think you know MJ. Because like, people think that he doesn't care at all about the community. He doesn't care about anybody else except for, you know, making money. I was like, no, that's not the MJ that I saw. You know, I saw him do incredible things. That's just one of them. I like, I remember right after... Um, 9-11 happened, you know, he called uh, somebody over there and he told them like, listen, I want to, you know, identify family members and victims of 9-11 um, and I want to donate um, my entire check to these people. I want you to disseminate to, to all of them in particular. And he said, I don't want you to go through any agency. I don't want to go through the, you know, and he named like five different agencies. I want it to be directly given to them. And they were like, all right, it's done. And then he left, and, I, and then I didn't hear anything else about it. And I was like, wow, that's amazing right there. Like, 
why don't, why, and I asked him one time, I was like, why don't you tell anybody about any of this stuff? And he said, I, I don't do it for that reason. And I was like, yeah, I know, but everybody thinks that, you know, and he, I was trying to explain to him, and he was just looking at me, he was shaking his head. He was like, you know, almost like he doesn't care what people say. And, and I, you know, it's just, there's a whole different side of MJ that people would, you know, don't know about, and it would change how they think of him as a person. 